Today, the palace coup you need to know about. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analysis. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined by Robbie Barber from the Citizens Party. Hi, Robbie. Hi, man. Good to see you back on again. And uh, boy, we've got some big news today, haven't we? We do. And I'm, I can't believe what we're about to talk about. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to uh, praise a regulator. Um, mm. But... But it's a it's a fascinating story, and everyone does need to know about this. And it's actually very closely connected to the Christine Holgate story. But but it actually this story proves what we originally thought was the motivation behind Christine Holgate. In my view, it it it, it reinforce it. We had a suspicion. This absolutely reinforces. Maybe I won't say proves, but it absolutely reinforces that suspicion that she was a victim of the banks because she represented an idea the banks feared, a, a, a public bank that they would have to compete with and break their monopoly. And the person we're about to, to talk about, I'm stunned to find out, was likewise a victim of the banks. Yep. Um, but can we leave the audience dangling while we deal with the breaking news? Yeah, and just to say that, um, you know, this is going to, we're going to talk about form again, right? So, you know, yes. a one-off thing with uh, Christine Holgate will be one thing, but this is more structural and therefore more serious. But it also has a direct relevance to an immediate issue relating to the responsible lending issue, which, of course, is also bubbling along and about to come up. Absolutely. And, and people will see when we go through the details what we mean. This, this, the story today is, going to, is definitely going to give you the background to what we're dealing with with responsible lending. However, we've actually had a lot of success in trying to stop the government watering down responsible lending laws. And we talked about this a few months ago. It came to a head in Parliament. The government, I think um, uh, in March, the government tried to get the Senate to vote on their responsible lending bill and um, realised they didn't have the votes and they pulled the vote. Not the bill, they pulled the vote, right? And it's been hanging there ever since. What's going to happen here? It's like the sort of Damocles. Um, now, they likely don't have the numbers, but... You can bet your bottom dollar they'll be working on the numbers. And working on the numbers means all kinds of things. Really hard to predict. And in fact, our story is going to reinforce, um, you know, the lengths they're prepared to go to. Go to. I might have told the story this time on, on this show before about how when Ricky Muir was in the Senate and, and um, uh, the government wanted to uh, water down uh, some of the rules that Labor had passed, Back in 2014, in 2014, the, some of the changes that Labor had made um, earlier, and Ricky Muir was the casting vote. Nick Xenophon um, took him out to dinner the night before the vote, so the Liberals couldn't access him. And he had 35 missed calls that night from Senator Matthias Cormann, the Finance Minister. 35 missed calls. That's the lengths to which the this Liberal government will go to do things for the bank. So you've got to absolutely. Be, be, be certain that they're doing all twisting all sorts of arms behind the scenes. Um, so while the bill's there, it's a threat, right? So on Monday, the Greens will move a motion that takes the bill out of the parliament entirely. Now, this is, this is the identical motion that Malcolm, Senator Malcolm Roberts uh, moved back in uh, November, sorry, December, on the cash ban. Remember, the cash ban had been well and truly defeated, but just, the, the bill was just sitting there. So was, we didn't really declare victory until Senator Roberts moved the motion and there was no opposition and the bill was taken out of the parliament. The Greens are going to try and do that with this bill, the responsible lending bill. However, arguably, the stakes are higher, right? So what we need people to do is call the cross benches. And you go to the, the, we can put the link below, you go to the Parliament website, aph.gov.au forward slash senators and members, whatever it's called. Um, find the, the, the senators who are not in the major parties, right? And that's One Nation, Centre Alliance, Rex Patrick, those type of senators. Call them up and say, you must support the Greens motion. Um, uh, I'm presuming the, the Labor Party does support the Greens motion, right? Which is probably what, which would be why the Greens are putting it up, but they're going to need these cross benches. So if that, if that motion's passed, this bill's out of the parliament. We can actually defeat this responsible lending law on Monday. So please make those... Look, this audience has proven time and again, when you hit the phones, start this afternoon, do it all day tomorrow, 
do it first thing Monday morning, hit the phones, make those calls, and we can actually defeat this bill. And just to be really, really clear, this is really important because at the moment, banks have an obligation to take account of the financial position and also the financial experience and knowledge of customers, right? What the responsible lending changes, if it came in, would do would put all of the asset on individuals, no responsibility on the banks at all. And that basically would allow the banks to lend even more than they are currently doing at the moment without any responsibility. And the reason that, the, and this is why it's important, the reason that the banks want this is because they are worried about the sort of Damocles hanging over them with regard to bad lending practice that's still out there. Yes. We, know, we know it's out there, we know it's happening now. Responsible lending is the only thing that's there to protect consumers at the moment because the other mechanism, which is the effectively, if you've got a problem, go to the ombudsman afterwards, doesn't solve it at all, right? So this is a really, really important decision to make sure that we don't dilute the current protections, which are critical, right? So this is why it's so important. Dr. Peter Branson heads a, a, a group called Bank Reform Now, and he's been leading the fight for bank victims for you know more than a decade. Um, he made a comment on this that, that stuck with me. He said, it's hard enough to get uh, enforcement against the banks with current laws. If you water down the obligation for responsible lending, you'll never get enforcement against the banks, right? And that's this is what we're dealing with. The, the, the system is weak enough as it is. There's no point weakening it. But it turns out, Martin, that this, this motivation to weaken these laws um, was behind a palace coup that we noticed half of it the second half has come to my attention uh in the last 48 hours and people need to know about this yeah absolutely and this goes back to the role of asic because asic was was the only regulator is the only regulator with some interest in trying to protect protect consumers right they have a broad mandate yep. but they were the ones that brought in the responsible lending rules earlier on and uh, of course they were involved in the um, the battle with westpac about the um what should happen westpac sort of agreed to settle and then of course it went to court and the court questioned it and it got to the point where asic uh, was about to appeal but then didn't yes right? and, and interestingly at that point the Reserve Bank, the government, everybody said, no, 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 don't do anything right now. This is part of a fundamental issue about weakening the role of the only regulator that's got some responsibility for thinking about and protecting consumers. Yes. And they, the links they've been prepared to take that intention is what we're going to talk about. So here's, here's the bottom line. Christine Holgate was ambushed in Parliament on the 22nd of October 2020, and the rest is history. Everybody knows the story. We, Citizens Party, this channel, were involved in telling the story, led to the Senate inquiry. It's all, it's all, all the revelations are there. It involved the banks, it involved um, stopping privatisation, um, etc. And, and we've got an excellent final report. The chairman of ASIC, James Shipton, on the basically received the Christine Holgate treatment on the same day, in the same way, using the same pretext for the same reason. Because he, in his own way, took on the banks. And it was about this responsible ending law and about the, the question of a um, of a, an appeal of the Wagyu and Shiraz case. And he, was, he has been dispatched in exactly the same way as Christian Holgate. So the two people who we have documented, so I'll give you the details of James Shipton now, but we've documented with Christine and now with James Shipton, two people who were heads of agencies in Australia that became a threat to the banks have been removed using exactly the same kind of operation. They're now out of there and are no longer the threat that they were. Right? Um, now... The good news is we know this, we're going to talk about it, and we are now the threat to the banks. That's the way you've got to understand this, right? Um, these, these things, they only get away with these things when there's public ignorance. So let me just give the details that are relevant, um, and then, um, you know, people can, can see what they think. We'll, we will include a link below. The article I'm about to uh, report on is in our magazine, the Australian Alert Service, which we issued yesterday. 
the latest issue, um, 16th of June. It's, it's a three-page article by Melissa Harrison entitled Morrison Government Overthrows Another Inconvenience to the Banks. Um, now, we, our, our papers, our magazines for, by subscription, but we, we have put this article up on our website. So we can include the link below. You can go read the whole article and see all the details. But this was the essence of it. 22nd of October, the Auditor General writes a letter to the Treasurer. Josh Frydenberg, and he highlights expenses claims relating to the chair and the deputy chair of ASIC, James Shipton and Daniel Crennan. Um, and actually, Martin, this is a story about both of them because as a duo, they were definitely a threat to the banks, not just, not just um, Shipton on himself. Shipton had recruited this guy, Daniel Crennan, a, a top-class enforcement lawyer, and he had... And I'll read you some quotes. These guys definitely intended to to um, uh, take the banks on. And it's worth so, saying, worth the saying, that was because ASEC had actually got huge flack from the Royal Commission into banking, right? Yes. And, the, and they actually basically came in to try and re-establish ASIC as a strong, powerful, independent regulator of financial services. The Royal Commission um, is the seminal event in... Australian in our time in Australian political history, even though its outcome has been very weak, it's it shook up enough stuff and had a knock on effect. I even think it's it's responsible for why Christine Holgate was able to get a deal with the banks. Um, they needed to rehabilitate their reputation, right? And and so they were prepared under those circumstances to agree to a deal um, because of what the Royal Commission did. All that's gone now, but but James Shipton and Daniel Crennan took over ASIC while ASIC executives are being shredded every day at the Royal Commission, people are collapsing on that stand. And I don't care who you are. You think, I'm the head of the agency that's being so obliterated here. And the only one, APRA got off scot-free, right? It was, RBA, nothing. It was, the, it was ASIC. Um, they, had, they definitely intended to do a modicum. We'll, we'll do that in a minute. I want people to understand how, how closely this, this issue, though, is parallel to the, the Christine Holgate operation. So there's a letter that the Auditor General provides the Treasurer um, on this issue. And I have to say, I'm not that impressed with this Auditor General, um, or oh, I shouldn't single him out per se, but I've seen a few things by him. I've seen him testify in front of Parliament. Um, I scratch my head sometimes. And our Auditor General's office, the Australian National Audit Office, is, is riddled with this um, uh, conflict of interest relationship with the big four accounting firms. Right, and I, I'd like to, I would have liked to think of them as a separate entity. Effectively, they may as well not be. Frankly, anyway, there's a letter that the Auditor General on the same day Christine Holgate's ambushed, he provides a letter to the Treasurer highlighting a similar issue: waste wasteful expenses by the Chair of ASIC and the Deputy Chair of ASIC. The next day, Josh Frydenberg announces an inquiry will be conducted, an independent inquiry into this, and the Chair will stand aside. ID format, exactly the same parallel as what they said to about uh, Christine Holgate, right? In independent inquiry, chair stand aside. Now, unlike Christine Holgate, you know, James Shipton obviously had a little bit more experience in this area. He didn't have the same uh, personal uh, reaction to that. And so it didn't get quite as dramatic, um, et cetera. But nevertheless, same kind of operation. They have an inquiry. The inquiry, like Christine Holgate's inquiry, cleared James Shipton and Daniel Crennan because, yeah, these were big expenses, except they had been agreed. ASIC had offered them this before they joined. Yes. This, was a, this was a package that they had actually accepted as part of joining ASIC. And guess what? It had already come to their attention that these expenses were unusual. Both men weeks earlier had already said they would personally repay them. There was no story. There was no issue. They'd already said that, right? The Auditor General, some, for some reason, helped the Treasurer make this an issue. So they have the inquiry. When, they, when, the, uh, when the, uh, the, the woman who does the inquiry hands down her report, um, there's a, there's a, uh, you can go to a website called The Claxon. Anthony Clan uh, is an investigative reporter. He used to work for The Australian, who's, who's documented quite a bit of this. He's gone off and 
as an independent uh, investigative reporter now. He's documented a lot of the irregularities of this inquiry, documentation being withheld, etc. But nevertheless, that was the that was the um, the bottom line. This had already been been agreed to uh, in advance. It wasn't it wasn't a reflection on on uh, Crennan and uh, 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 Shipton at all. Um, but the outcome was the treasurer said, yes, the inquiry has has cleared his name. However, we have. The, Mr. Shipton and I have agreed that he should move on. So that then brings up, well, what was going on? Well, it turns out that these two had definitely been at odds. James Shipton, with the support of Daniel Crennan and the Treasurer of Australia, had definitely been at odds. And it was about the question of the enforcement of the bank's uh, following the Royal Commission. Now, I've got some quotes here. Um, uh, th there's, a, there's an article from the 15th of April 2021 Financial Review, which was, there's, a, there's been a lot of commentary in the Fin Review describing this dynamic that was at play here. Um, so we've only, I have to confess, we've only just started looking at it, but man, it's, we've, all, we've compiled a lot of it. Melissa Harrison's compiled a lot of it in this article. Um, uh, the, the 15th of April 2021 Financial Review said there was more, far more to the breakdown between Frydenberg and Shipton than relocation expenses, the expenses related to him coming from Hong Kong and Crennan going from Melbourne. Um, after, after Commissioner Hayne handed down his February 2019 report, quote, Shipton, sorry, Shipton reportedly, quote, swerved to Hayne world. That was the analysis of the financial review. There was an event, the 27th of March, 2019, Australian Financial Review Banking and Wealth Summit. Shipton slammed the banks for criticising ASIC's stepped up litigation only 50 days after the Royal Commission's final report because ASIC had said, we're stepping up litigation. And they had a letter from the treasurer saying, why not litigate? Your ASIC, it's your, it's your job to take them to court. And... Shipton said at this event in front of all these bankers, it is extraordinary that I am up here today saying something as basic as obey the law. And that's quite a message that he feels he has to send to these bankers. Yep. Um, uh, he also warned that this litigation would involve larger financial institutions, right? The big four are not the untouchable big four. Now, Daniel Crennan weighed in. He said that the, um, he said cases would soon spike as ASIC pursued the banks for civil and criminal breaches of the law, specifically referring to the Corporations Act, which requires the provision of services, quote, efficiently, honestly, and fairly. This is Crennan now. These were, quote, basic human concepts. They are not difficult. Crennan said, we are not going away. The best thing to do is cooperate. And apparently, oh, someone just described me earlier. He's apparently he's like a six foot five giant, this Daniel Crennan. Um, and, and you know, as in, in courts of law and all that kind of stuff, these these, these personal dynamics can be can be quite something. Um, so he's not someone that, that looks like he's going to be easily intimidated, right? Um, then Shipton said this: he exposed the myth that responsible lending laws were choking credit. And you could probably say more about that myth than anybody. He pointed out that these laws were nothing new but had been in place for a decade, saying, quote, I really do want to debunk any myth that these regulations are causing economic concern. They are not. Now, what he's meaning there by economic concern is he's saying these laws are not hindering the recovery of the economy. Yet, what did Josh Frydenberg claim when he introduced his bill to water down the responsible lending laws, we need to do this because this is getting in the way of an economic recovery. Well, actually, Rob, it was worse than that. The name of the bill was about economic recovery itself. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, talk about um, marketing spin. Well, let me just, I'll, I'll, um, you're, you're, you're exactly right on that. It's called the. Uh, uh, National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, quote, brackets, supporting economic recovery bill. <laughs> That's what it's called. 
So <laughs> I always said right from the very beginning, as soon as I saw the title, spin. That is absolute yep. spin, right? And they've been banging on about this, saying it's stopping people um, getting credit, etc., etc. And then, of course, they refer to small businesses, despite the fact that small businesses aren't caught within the responsible lending obligations. Yep. So they, they've they've gone all over the place trying to separate responsible lending obligations from the banks who are still up for considerable risk simply because they made a bunch of bad decisions over a number of years. Now, I appeal to your audiences, the, the, the long-term faithful ones, their memory here, um, Martin, because, uh, like I said, you have documented this, this question of credit um, into the economy better than anybody. In fact, there was... There was a, a period of time between the uh, 2019 election and around July, August. This, this is my memory now because around July, August is when the cash ban campaign started. And we got very involved in that, required a lot of focus. And then, you know, um, within a few months, of course, COVID pandemic. And of course, with the COVID pandemic, remember one of the things was a holiday on mortgages. And so those there was, a, there was a lot of issues that we'd been focusing on in 2019, which were suddenly put on ice because, you know, people were getting mortgage holidays and things. But we were focusing on mortgage stress, right? Skyrocketing mortgage stress and the shrinkage in uh, bank credit into uh, the mortgage bubble. Yep. It was going down. And you had, um, I remember there was a big scandal because you had Nerida Connorsby from realestate.com.au on your show and she contradicted Christopher Joy who was saying that the property market's coming back and she said, well, we, we can't see it. And of course, she's in a much better position based on her data to, to, to tell the truth. We knew that they were desperately trying to get this market back up, right? Because it, why? It's the only trick they've got. This is, that's the thing with this government. This is all we have as an economy. Yes, you know, we've got resources exports, but in terms of the thing that we're all exposed to, it's the property market. It's the only trick they've got. And they're desperate trying to get it back up. This was the dynamic. And this was the context in which um, Shipton started making himself an obstacle to this intention because he wouldn't go along. He was actually making contradictory statements to these things like we need to, we need to um, uh, weaken responsible lending laws. Uh, 2nd of October, this is, I'll, I'll quote you now from, by September 2019, like a month after we're talking, and then the 2nd of October 2019, The Guardian reported that after heavy lobbying from the banks, Frydenberg, Josh Frydenberg, the treasurer, told a property forum that if responsible lending laws were, quote, applied too stringently, unquote, it would, quote, inevitably reduce the availability of credit, unquote, suggesting outrageously that, quote, an unduly restrictive application of responsible lending laws could do as much harm as an overly lax one. And that was the beginning. This is, uh, you know, 2019. That was the beginning of the propaganda to lay the foundation for this responsible lending um, bill. Hmm. Now, I don't know if you have a comment on the, cre the credit question, but one of the, I'll, I'll just make the obvious one. They've got their property market back now. The credit's flying into into mortgages again, and we've still got the same responsible lending laws. Yep. It was bogus. Correct. It was totally bogus. And just a couple of observations. The first is that the average first time buyer loan being written now is 15% bigger than it was a year ago, right? under the current responsible lending obligations, right? Now, my own belief is that many banks are actually going around the responsible lending yeah. obligations. They haven't actually, they are not following the law as it currently exists, right? The other interesting well, that's thing- That's a good point. I, yeah. that, does, that does qualify the bogus question. And, yeah. and hence the, the, the urgent necessity for these laws being watered down so that yes. they can cover themselves after the fact. Co correct, because actually we know that there are loans that should not have been made that have been made. So that's the first one we're seeing in the data. The, the second interesting observation is that um, we are now seeing the Council of Financial Regulators beginning to stir. They've written to the banks again, right, and say, well, you just make quite sure that you are actually being responsible on your on your lending. You know, that's about the best wet lettuce th throw they've got, because the only, only thing they can do is write a letter, right? It was ASIC who was the one who was really scaring them, right? Yeah. And, and so we've seen a drift of bad behaviour from the banks over the last few months, simply because we've had this bubble up of, um, of credit, we've had very low interest rates. And of course, overnight, the Federal Reserve 
has brought forward their expectation of future rate rises. So suddenly that 2024, well, nothing's going to happen till then from the Reserve Bank is looking really shaky, right? Interest rates are going to rise sooner, right? Mm. And so the responsible lending yep. uh, wobbliness that we've had over the last couple of years are going to come home again unless they find yet another you know, thing to pull out of the cupboard and say, well, we'll, um, you know, give more money away or we'll cut rates or well, we'll do something else, right? It's the tide, it, the, the interest rates going up. It's the tide going out, isn't it? Yeah, and you it see is. Swimming it naked. is a, 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 absolutely. And yep. then the final point to make is that the responsible lending obligations that were clearly broken and were shown through the Royal Commission, right? That was past history, but that's still there. Yeah. There are still yes. people who genuinely believe that they were actually given loans that under the responsible lending obligations they should never have been given. Now, the reason those cases haven't come through, the class actions haven't come through, is because everyone's waiting to see what happens with regard to this legislation. But of course, the point is, even if the legislation is turned off now, you've still got historic risk from yep. those loans over the last five to eight years that were made when people actually shouldn't have got the loans in the first place, right? So this is a this is a real live sleeping time bomb, right, with a fuse that's still burning at the moment. And what people are hoping in the banking sector is that somehow magically the treasurer can snuff out the fuse and defuse the bomb before it goes off. Well, look, what, I mean, one... One point that I'm conscious of making, because I, I know a lot of bank victims, and I do want to add a bit of a caveat. I've said very positive things about um, Shipton and Crennan, and, and you know, they, they probably deserve it. But um, one of the reasons that these two things they did are so significant is because that the, knock, the, the consequences are immediate. They, they really could have been, were an obstacle to this plan to revive the property bubble. That's not to say that, you know, ASIC suddenly became a perfect regulator, of course, you know, and, and, and it's still too weak on real consumer protection, et cetera. And there's a, there's a lot of, um, so in other words, let me put it this way, James Shipton was no Christine Holgate because Christine yep. Holgate did some really incredible stuff for Australia Post really to help people, et cetera. But people have to understand that, that even though these were identifying two things he did, um, where ASIC could, should have gone and, opened up cases for thousands and thousands of bank victims, frankly, uh, go talk to Denise Braley about it. You know, yep. I mean, Denise's evidence is anecdotal, of course, but she knows the cases because she's worked on them, right? And it is rife how much fraud was out there that, um, you know, the banks are, 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 should be held accountable for. But that's, ASIC hasn't, didn't do that and hasn't done that. And, but maybe it could have come to that, who knows? But these two little things, why are they so significant? Because people have to appreciate how fragile our economy is, right? When you, you know, I mean, you could make a comparison to the the, the epiphany that Australia is vulnerable because um, in, in terms of trade, because, you know, we've got one massive trading partner, right? And if that relationship goes bad, look what happens. Well, the same parallel, the same point can be made about the property bubble. It, it's, it's literally a one trick in our economy and they had to get this back because if that slide had have kept going, the con this, this would have been a, a, an unmitigated disaster and you would have had banks going under, big banks, big four banks. And I always thought if one went under, um, well, they're all almost identical businesses. <laughs> they all go under, right? And you would have had to have nationalisation and all sorts of stuff in Australia, total chaos, um, et cetera. Now, one of the evidences of that is who who gets off scot free when it comes to the question of the property bubble? It's always the Reserve Bank. Yep. Right. They have created this thing. There's a one of the things we're documenting it in the in the alert though, Martin is I'm loving it now. There's there's three senators that are triple teaming the Reserve Bank every few months in Parliament. Jared Rennick, Malcolm Roberts, and Nick McKim, the Green Senator. Right. And they get the Reserve Bank there and they say, "What are you doing?" that's other than prop other than the property market and guy de bell you know um lashes you know flails around you know trying to he's often giving exactly the same answers every hearing uh etc on this question because they don't don't have an idea sometimes it dissembles quite uh badly it's all they it's all they think of is the property market so here's back to it just in terms of some details of what you said earlier this other issue 
I've decided responsible ending, which was the question of appealing the Wagyu and Shiraz decision. Because what happened, they took we ASIC took Westpac to court. Um, Lindsay, David and Philip Seuss did a lot of work documenting Westpac's mortgage book, right? In fact, they even sent a whole, uh, uh, um, I think they provided a large sample of the mortgage book details to the, the Royal Commission. Right, it was a this this was a, a stunning the, the the stuff in that mortgage book is, is is incredible, so they go to court, and the whole of the industry seemed to hinge on this decision, <laughs> and the judge said, well, no, you can't blame the banks for the mortgage stress because if these people are stressed and having difficulty paying their mortgage, they should stop eating wagyu and drinking Shiraz, and you know I don't know did you poll your uh, your uh, your survey how how many people in Mandra and and uh the, 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 you know donny brook and alan brook uh are eating wagyu and drinking shiraz did you find out? well actually not many people knew what wagyu was so that's the first point <laughs> uh, and the second one it's more like um you know uh, beer and snags <laughs> no that's right They're beer and snags and beer light beer and that's if you're lucky now now they've come up with um no, no non-alcoholic beer for mortgage stress people, <laughs> which which is <laughs> defeats the purpose as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, so what do they do? ASIC, it was a ridiculous decision. ASIC was going to appeal it. And bear in mind, they've got a, this guy, Crennan, apparently had quite a reputation, right? In fact, he's the son of a former high court judge. Um, I've seen a photo of him standing next to uh uh, or, or his his parents standing next to Justice Hayne, uh, the the Royal Commissioner, right? So look, this guy's connected, and he by his by his language, you know, they weren't afraid to take on the banks. So ASIC gets a call from the Reserve Bank Governor himself and the Treasury Secretary, so that's Philip Lowe, and Treasury Secretary Stephen Kennedy, who said that the court case, if they didn't appeal, quote might undermine lending in the COVID-19 recovery. That's heavy duty, duty pressure. Yep. Brought to bear by, from the godfather of the Australian banking system himself. John Adams would be happy with me calling him that. Uh, John, John calls him the godfather. The godfather himself brought direct pressure to bear on James Shipton um, to drop that case, right? And apparently uh, Frydenberg was spewing. So this is, this is what... This was the conflict that had built up between Josh Frydenberg and James Shipton and Daniel Crennan. And so come COVID, they get to print like crazy. You know, they just seize on the COVID thing to put out all this money out there, mortgage holiday, etc. All they were doing was it was the ultimate way to buy time, right? And we're coming to October 2020. And, you know, they got all these plans to put in place. The, 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 there's a lot of analysis about how, um, uh, what's his name, Frydenberg was determined to completely overhaul ASIC and bring it under more direct control because ASIC was getting too serious about implementing the Royal Commission's recommendations, right? Um, but this guy, James Shipton, uh, wasn't going to be part of that plan. And so, yes, on the same day, in the same way, using a, a, an inquiry on the same pretext of personal expenses, they got rid of James Shipton and Daniel Crennan for the same reason, because they got in the way of the banks. The yep. banks are the ultimate lobby and power in this country, especially in terms of the Liberal Party. And everything that Josh Frydenberg did in this regard was cheered by the bankers cheer squad in parliament. And those, that cheer squad are all the guys from the Institute of Public Affairs, people like James Patterson and Tim Wilson. They were cheering this all the way. They were, they were the attack dogs in Parliament, personally attacking ASIC and James Shipton for all the various things uh, to do with the debate, not just not the expenses, the debate, right, about the best way to take on the banks. These guys are out of the... The, the banks founded the IPA in 1943. Um, Martin, they founded it, right? The, in fact, the same banks... I'll give you a history lesson. Ten years earlier, these same banks funded paramilitary gangs in Australia who identi self-identified as fascists who were prepared to run a coup 
These same banks were prepared to run a coup. It's all documented. We've, we've written, put copious articles out about this. I spent hundreds of hours in, in uh, the State Library in New South Wales and Victoria and a special military library in, in uh, the back blocks of Sydney there somewhere. Um, things like if people have heard of the New Guard, the Old Guard, the White Army, these sort of things, they were funded by the banks. And 10 years later, those same banks founded the, in 1943, founded the Institute of Public Affairs. The next year, the Institute of Public Affairs founded the Labor Party, sorry, the Liberal Party. It was the IPA that founded the Liberal Party. Um, now, over that journey, you know, it's, it's, it's not always uh, total control, et cetera, but this is their, this is their DNA. And it was, there was the, it's the IPA guys, boys in parliament that, have, that cheered this all the way along. This was a palace coup. Yeah. Now I have one other history thing to say, and I just it's, I just discovered it. I, I, I have to say it. Some people may appreciate the history more than others, especially if you live through it. Um, but you know, you and I have talked many times about um, the neoliberal, you know, takeover of Australia, and the neoliberal takeover of Australia paralleled the neoliberal takeover of the whole world, right? And it ended up one of the, you know the hallmarks were things like financial deregulation, which which led to the financialization of our economy where we went from being an economy that was primarily manufacturing and agriculture to, a, to an economy that was now financial services and construction, but construction relating to a housing bubble, right? And then there's some resource exports, et cetera. That's, that's called financialization and financial deregulation did that. Sorry, I keep hitting my microphone here. Um, there, th it's been well documented in the 80s that for this neoliberal takeover to happen, there was an actual, there was a coup effectively a coup in the Australian political parties. And it's been called a coup in the Liberal Party because the Liberal Party had this division between what was known as the wets and the dries, right? And the wets were the old traditional Liberals, more of the, you know, the Menzies type, et cetera, but people who accepted that you've got to have regulation, you've got to have um, government institutions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there were the, the dries who were these hardcore privatisers and deregulators, et cetera. And here in Victoria, there was an operation to get the dries out of parliament. Sorry, get the wets out of parliament, replace them with these dries, right? And they targeted them in all their seats. Paul Kelly, the scribe of Australian politics, wrote a book documenting all this. It was called The End of Certainty. He actually tells in that book how they used to have secret meetings. He calls them secret meetings. And he says he knows because he was in them where they were holding these meetings plotting all this and they kept them secret because they didn't want Malcolm Fraser, the Prime Minister at the time, to know because he would squash the meetings, right, because he was regarded as, as uh, one of the wets. Anyway, cut a long story short, this is how Peter Costello got into Parliament. And Peter Costello, as his whole political career, was an arch neoliberal. And in fact, if one of the things to, if, if you remember, he was replaced by Kelly O'Dwyer and she did this she did, she did one of the most embarrassing interviews in Australian political history on, ins on the Sunday Pro Insiders during the Royal Commission, right, where she refused, she couldn't answer why they had opposed the Royal Commission, right, mm -hmm. because, because they were protecting the banks. This is the same party that let, they just let the banks run right, right? It was, it's their philosophy. This is, the, this is in their DNA. It's their philosophy. Peter Costello got to Parliament um, by replacing, forcing out the member for Higgins, in um, Melbourne. That member for Higgins' name is Roger, or was, he's died, Roger Shipton, the father of James Shipton, the man we're just talking about. Yep. I don't know if that's how significant that is, but I do know that this comes down to a philosophical battle, right? People who say, after the global financial crisis and after the Royal Commission, some, we've got to change this system that led to this. And then the defenders of the banks who say, no, you're not going to touch anything, banks come first, right? And yeah. I suspect with that background, that might have been one of the influences on James Shipton to, um, you know, take the tone he did, which got him into trouble. Yeah, and look, this is the point. This is an ideological thing, right, we're talking about here. This is fundamentally what is our economy going to be built on into the future, right? Is it going to be more, you know, selling loans to people for a longer duration because all they want is your cash flow, right, for the rest of your yep. life, right up yep. to death and beyond, right? That's what they're interested in. They see individuals as people who can pay money to them, right? That is not productive. It doesn't create 
a no. real fruitful economy. It doesn't allow investment into businesses that can create things and make things and create value for us all, right? All it is doing is creating a concentration of wealth in an ever smaller part, the 1% or whatever you want to call it, right? Who are sitting at the top of this financialization pillar, right? Yep. And everybody else is just basically subservient to it. That's one end of the ideology. The other end is to say, no, 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 we've got to turn this around. We've actually got to create an economy that's there for the people and creating real value. And that means we have to change the role of our financial system. We have to change the role of our regulation. We have to change the role of those in power to focus on the good and the benefits of the many, not the few. Well, that's, and that's why... Um I have, I have. Uh, in, on that note, I have, I do have one final thing to plug in this regard, um, because it is very important to have regulation that works. Now, Dr. Wilson Sai, who formerly worked at ASIC for a few years and 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 was the chief researcher at APRA, he wrote a paper in 2018 called "The Farce of Fake Regulation," where his whole point <laughs> is he even predicted the Wagyu and Shiraz ruling he would did. go against ASIC because he said. Yep. These laws are designed to be unenforceable because the people who wrote them don't believe in regulation, right? And so people like shift, you know, if you if you get the proper guy into ASIC, his hands are tied behind his back anyway. Is is, is the problem? Um, so you've got to clean up the regulator. But this story about Shipton shows you that you can't just rely on that. Now we have to do it, but we can't just rely on that because it's like any police force. The the, the gangsters, if they can't buy off the cops. We'll kill the cops. Yep. Right? That's so, so what else can you do that adds to the picture? Well, you can come up with actually really basic regulation that almost doesn't have to be enforced because it's so clear cut, such as Glass-Steagall, right? Separate commercial bank financial system that serves the people from all the crazy stuff, all the funny speculation, et cetera. That's a good idea. Also, you can bring back public financial institutions that force the private financial institutions to compete with them because anyone who's honest about the current banking system with the big four knows they do not compete, right? All they compete for is bigger profits from the same looting operation. They need, we need to break that monopoly. And this is what a postal bank will do. We envisage a postal bank as part of a national banking system. We need a development bank. We need to, we need to bring back the we totally reform the RBA to a proper national bank, but a postal bank is a good start. Where at a, at a services level, it's there and it's backed up completely by the Australian people, right? It's com fully guaranteed, and it forces the banks to complete compete. And that, um, because it's there just to provide basic financial services, where service is more important than profit, even though it will make a profit. If the banks want to maintain customers, they have to compete with that. And, and, it, and it injects a, 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 a regulatory health back into the system that is sort of, it, it's, um, uh, it's standalone in the sense that, yeah, there'll still be, uh, the, the regulators will always play a role, but um, this will be very effective just as a standalone uh, initiative, right, that, that, that creates a dynamic that keeps the financial system healthy in that respect. And that's why we got into this whole subject in the first place, because we advocate a postal bank. There's a lot of support for a postal bank. So one of the things we've done this week is we've launched a, um, a resolution campaign. We, we've got a resolution we're asking. We need to build support in the community, a groundswell of grassroots support to, to force the parliament to pass the bill we've written for called the Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank Bill. Um, and we've got a resolution we're asking people to take to your to your, your local councils, chambers of commerce, et cetera, get them to pass this resolution. And when they pass it, as this institution, you know, um, Timbuktu Council endorse, you know, has passed this resolution, take it to the local federal member of parliament. So they start they start getting flooded with with um, notices that this these institutions and their electorates have endorsed this bill, right? And we can build a grassroots groundswell to actually force this through. These are the, the various initiatives that can um, actually, we can achieve this, and from the standpoint of health of the financial system, it's complementary to the things we need to do to clean up the regulatory system, etc. Mm. And one other point, uh, Robbie, um, financial stability is about making sure that we have strong banks that are doing the right thing, and uh, you know, 
doing the right thing for the broader Australian economy, right? Not just creating more speculation yeah. and, you know, derivatives trading, all of those things and trading on trading. Um, in the current environment with interest rates really low and now perhaps going up a little, right? The amount of financial instability that we have around the world has probably never been higher. The way to address financial stability properly is to do just what you've said, yeah. right? Not have weaker and weaker regulation, not remove consumer um, yes. support, right, and, and consumer rights, as it were, but to actually recognize that banking has a place in the economy, but is not the economy, right? And in fact, the University yes. of New South Wales published a brilliant report this week, which I recommend everybody should read, talking about the elephant that's trampling the economy, right? And that elephant is the way that the banking system and the property system has has got to the point where it's, you know, eroding everything else that's there, right? This yeah, is right. now, this is now a really, really critical issue. So responsible lending is, you know, one of the lead issues, but this is part of a broader conversation about the future design and execution implementation of the way that our economy and therefore our society works. One of the reasons people should read the paper you just mentioned is because the minute you do, you know more than most members of parliament on this subject. <laughs> Because they have been, they have drunk the Kool Aid, yep. as, as they say. Yep. No, they've been brainwashed. Um, they really have. Yep. yep. It, they have. They have accepted that this is going to be. This is our economic structure, and it's it's to the. the, and, the uh, and I'll make one other point. I know from from a number of conversations I've had privately that people are very very frightened within Parliament of you know the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, right? And they don't want to actually go against what the Treasury and the Treasurer are basically advocating, but your point is dead right, that linkage back to the banks, which basically means the reason that many politicians aren't able or willing to stand up is because they're frightened of the banks and what they can do. Yep. No, that's right. But we need to make them more frightened of us. And that does work. And we've, we've seen many instances of that. Um, yep. This is this is another one, the, the latest one. So please, if you've hung on for this whole time, thank you. Uh, remember, call, get on the phone, find those those uh, those crossbench senators and call them and say support that bill on Monday. Uh, support that motion, sorry, to get rid of the responsible lending uh, bill uh, on Monday. That's very important. And get on our website, follow the link to uh, that we'll put to Melissa's article. Have a look at it. We will do updates on this on this uh, subject. And yeah, we this by exposing this subject now. This can very much help to kill the the attempt to water down responsible lending and start the process of uh, reforming the financial system properly. Yeah, Robbie, thanks for your time today. This is a really, really important conversation. You know, it's uh, many years in the making, actually, with all the yeah. things that you and I have both been doing independently and together or where, where we've come together on particular things. But there is now a very important uh, decision point ahead and it's part of a much broader conversation, which we will definitely come back to. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. See you later. See ya.